So how do you build the perfect epoxy table the first time? You're planning to build your first table or you built one already or you want to start a company manufacturing epoxy tables. There's two answers to that question. The short answer is, down in the description of this video, you'll find a link that will take you to our website, that will take you to our online shop. There, you'll find a document. This document I compiled over a period of eight months, is 41 pages long, and it's going into intense detail on how we, as a epoxy table company manufacturer, build all our tables. It's all our methods, our techniques, everything you need to know in this document, you'll find in this link in the description. The long answer to that question is, how do you build the perfect epoxy table the first time? Step one, moisture content. You need to make sure that the moisture content in your wooden slab is sitting at the right percentage. The moisture content in your slab needs to sit between 8 and 12%, not more, not less. If it's going to be more than 12%, it means there's too much water inside your slab. Now, what's going to happen if you're going to use a slab that the moisture percentage is more than 12%? Now, if wood is going to dry over time, wood shrinks. Now, your table is either going to delaminate from the epoxy, your table is going to crack, it can warp, there's so much things that can go wrong if you're not using the right percentage wood for your specific table. Step two, removing all the bark and softwood from your slab. You need to make sure you remove all the bark and softwood from your slab because you don't want your epoxy to stick to a material that is not fastened to your slab. Now, think logic. When you see a tree and a bark, you go up to the tree, you can remove the bark with your hand. You don't want your epoxy to stick to the bark. Make sure you use a wire steel brush and any steel brush with a baby grinder and you can remove all the bark and softwood from your slab. Step three, designing your table. This step is what's going to make you stand out above any other person or company that's building and designing tables. This is where you need to spend time picking the correct slab to build the perfect table. This is what's going to make you stand out and be different from any other person or company building tables. Step four, building your mold. Now there's two ways you can build a mold. The way we build all our molds is using a white melamine sheet and we apply wax release mold agent inside the mold of our table. So the other way is you can either use MDF superwood and use tuck tape but tuck tape isn't something we've got available in our country. So we just go with the way we know on building tables and that's using a white melamine sheet and applying wax release mold agent on the inside. And always, always remember a massive tip is to always make sure you build your table slightly bigger in length and width. And the sides of your mold, you also need to make sure is slightly bigger than your slab because when you're going to pour, the epoxy can't overflow. Uh, onto your floor or whatever the case may be. Step five, insert the slab into your mold. Now, when you're going to insert the slab into your mold, make sure you don't pull the slab on the surface you just applied the wax release mold agent. And also make sure that when your slab is sitting inside your mold, you use uh, cross braces and clamps to fasten your workpiece down to make sure once you're going to pour the epoxy, the wood is not going to move at all. Step six, epoxy. Now, there's two types of epoxy. Deep casting epoxy and multi-layered epoxy. Now, it depends on what you have available and your budget. Now, for we as a company, we like using multi-layer epoxies. It just means that we pour our epoxy in layers and we don't pour everything at one shot. Now, there's a reason for this. Deep casting epoxy is super expensive, that's why we use the multi-layer epoxy. Step seven, epoxy, colors, and pigments. Now, this is also something that you need to discuss with your client or a specific color you want for your epoxy table. Now, there's only really one way I know in getting the color you want and that's when you're going to mix your epoxy and uh, resin all together in one bucket. 
you take a transparent see-through cup, scoop some of the epoxy out in your bucket to about the same thickness you're planning to pour your table and that's going to give you a very good idea of how your end color will look um, on your table. Step 8, pouring the epoxy. Now there's nothing really special about this step. You can pour any way you want. The reason why we pour at a slow pace is to prevent too much bubbles from being inside your epoxy. Now I know there's thousands of different brands of epoxy on the, epoxies on the market and some epoxies are more liquidy than other epoxies. Now our epoxy we have available in our country is not that liquidy as the epoxies you get from uh, overseas meaning that our epoxy is a little bit more thicker and much more air bubbles can be trapped inside the epoxy. That's why we pour at a very slow pace. Step 9. Removing bubbles. Now, there's a few ways you can do this. You can either start off before you're going to pour your epoxy, you can have a combustion chamber that will remove basically all the bubbles from your batch epoxy you just mixed. Now for us as a epoxy company manufacturer, we don't use combustion chambers at this stage. We will most probably invest in this at the later stage, but the way we use it is we make sure our epoxy is sitting at around about 22 to 27 degrees before we start pouring. Now that's going to help most of the air bubbles to rise up and you can just pop them with a gas flame gun. Or heat gun now we haven't really used heat guns before so I can't really answer too much on that specific topic but we use an open flame and when you use an open flame to remove most of the bubbles on your epoxy you need to make sure that your flame is always moving and don't apply too much heat at one section of your table and we will typically um, when we pour a table we will come with a gas flame gun um, when we are done with that section, we will wait around about 10 to 20 minutes, then we will come back and use the gas flame gun again over the same spots and you will see most of the air bubbles will be released once you put the flame on the epoxy. Step 10, sanding between epoxy layers. What does this mean? Now this specific step does not apply for deep casting epoxy. It applies for epoxies that you cast in multiple layers. Now we will typically, if we're going to do five pours on a table, we will pour our first layer, pour our second layer, then we will sand, then we will pour our third layer, our fourth layer, then we will sand, then we will do our last layer. Now why do we sand between layers? It's just going to help the epoxy bond better to the layers you just cast. Now, you, this isn't really been proven, but we do this anyway. Um, now you'll think you'll see the sanding marks between all the layers, you don't. Once you pour that epoxy, you will not see the sanding layers or marks or scratches you just made by sanding in between all the layers. Step 11, curing time. Now this is something you need to source from the epoxy supplier you're buying your epoxy from. But for us, we need to wait around about three to five days for our epoxy to cure once we can remove our table from our mold. Step 12, removing your table from your mold. So once your epoxy table is cured fully according to your supplier's recommendation on how long you need to leave your epoxy before you can start working with it you need to remove your table from your mold now the wax release mold agent you just used you will see that your epoxy table will come off easily from the white melamin sheet you just used now the only tip i can give you in this step is don't use steel hammers to remove the side panels of your epoxy table, use a rubber or wooden mallet to remove the white melamine side walls of your mold. It's going to make sure that you're not hitting the epoxy or the wood and that can damage or scratch or break the epoxy if you're going to use a steel hammer. Step 13, flattening your slab. Now, there's two methods you can do this. You can either use a router sled, which, will, which you will be manually flattening your slab, 
which will leave your shop super dirty, full of dust. It's going to take a ton of time. If you don't have another choice, use a manual router sled or in our case, right at the beginning of our journey, we also flattened all our slabs on a router sled. But then we moved to the other method and that's by a CNC machine. Now, now we don't have our own CNC machine, but we've got a supplier that's flattening all our slabs for us. Step 14, closing all the cracks and holes on your rivet table. Now you will see once you flatten your slab and you've got it back in your shop, you will see there's a lot of cracks and holes that needs to be filled. Now we used right at the beginning, we will typically fill those cracks with the same color epoxy we used on our project. Now that resulted in that specific mark, crack or hole we filled left a stain on the wood where we filled that small little crack. Then we moved to clear epoxy. It made the situation better, but at some stages you will find that you will still see the wood that's stained. Now, the new method we are using is, we will typically come and do a very thin layer of epoxy over the complete surface of our table. Now, once you done with a thin layer, you will see that some of the holes and cracks still needs to be filled. That's the time when you need to fill those cracks and holes. Now, once that's dry, then you can come off and sand it. It basically means that you are not only staining that small little crack and hole, it basically means that you stain the whole table. Step 15, sanding your table. Now, we typically start sanding a table with our Festool Rotex machine on a 80 grit sandpaper. We used to use a belt sander right at the beginning, but we found that belt sanders are removing too much materials at once when you, don't when you are not focusing on sanding your table. This resulted in once you deliver your table and you're done with your oil and stuff, there's certain parts on your epoxy that you will see it's wavy. Now your client will never pick this up, but we as a epoxy table company manufacturer pick this up. That's why we don't use the belt sanders anymore. We are using the Festool Rotex machine. Now, what makes the Rotex special is it's got two different settings. It's got your normal orbital sander setting, then it's got a Rotex setting. Now the Rotex setting is a very aggressive type of sanding but it's not as aggressive as a belt sander so we will typically start sanding our table off with the rotex machine on an 80 grit sandpaper step 16 continue sanding now let's talk about sanders sanders you get a ton of sanders on the market but sanding epoxy you need a finishing sander now we learned this the hard way if you're going to use a normal orbital sander and you use a epoxy color that's a solid type of color, you will not have a problem. But if you're going to use a smoky semi see-through finish or a high gloss see-through finish, you will definitely pick up problems. Finishing sanders are specifically built for finishing. Normal orbital sanders is built for sanding wood up to whatever grit, but it's built for wood. Now, finishing sanders is critical. You will find that if you're going to use normal orbital sanders on your epoxy, you will have swirl marks and you will forever and ever have swirl marks on your projects and you will not take it away. That's why we've spoken to so many different suppliers overseas and the finishing sander we use is a Festool ETS-5, uh, it's designed for finishing, it's got a very stable shaft and we can sand for long durations of time and we found that this machine is giving us the perfect finish for all our tables. Now, once you're done sanding your table with the 80 grit sandpaper, you will move to 120 grit, 180 grit, 220 grit and then 320 grit. Now we will stop at 320 grit, then we will move to the next step. Step 17, routering and cutting your table to its final size. Now, 
Once you are done sanding to 320 grit, that's when you're gonna come and put your track on top of your table and cut your table to its final size. And once that's done, you will always use that same flat surface. You just sand it to 320 grit. Your router will have a perfect smooth edge to run on. Step 18, finishing. This is where you need to decide what finish you want on your table. You're obviously deciding this right before you start your project, but for a smoky finish, on your table. So we will typically sand our tables to 320 or 400 grit sandpaper. Or if you want a high gloss see-through finish, this is where you will sand your table all the way up to 1,500 grit, and then you will take it through to the polishing stages. Now, step 19 will follow. Uh, if you are not going for a smoky finish on your table, you will polish your table. Now, the polishing stages of your table, we like using the face tool system. Now, for the polishing part of your table, we use the face tool system. It's a very easy system. You got three different colors with three different polish pads. You got orange, blue, and white in that order. And this is giving us the perfect finish on all our tables. Now, you will send your table to 1,500. Then you will start with your orange color, your blue color, and then your white color. Now, we will typically use a polish machine for this part as well uh, on a very low RPM. Step number 20, oil. What oil do you use for your table? And where do you apply your oil? Now, there's a lot of questions I get when we do a high gloss see-through finish where we polish our epoxy. We always get comments on why don't you apply the oil over the epoxy? Well, this well, the epoxy is a polished surface. It's like your window at home. If you're going to apply cooking oil to your window, you will have a hard time removing it. So, if you're going to do a smoky finish on your table, where you sand your table to 320 grit or 400 grit, then we apply the oil over the wood and the epoxy section. Now, if you're going to polish your table, we, this is what we are doing, we will not apply the oil on the epoxy. We will only apply the oil on the wood section of our table. And the types of oil we like using, there's two applications we like to use. We like to use Rubia Monocoat, or we will typically use Odis oils. Step number 21 is how to fasten your steel base to the underside of your table. Now, we used to use hex screws right at the beginning of our builds, but then we used to threaded insets for multiple reasons. Threaded insets, first of all, is a very clean, smooth look. And from our last four tables, we started using base plates on our steel bases just for a better fastening surface, if I can put it that way. So your steel base is much more secured and fastened to the underside of your wood. Now the last step and step number 22 is maintenance. So once you deliver your table to your client or you built it for yourself, the one question we 100% get from all our clients is, can epoxy scratch? And the easiest answer to that question is yes. Just like 95% of all materials around the world, everything can scratch. Your car can scratch, your face can scratch, the wood can scratch, everything can scratch. I think granite is, there's, there's not a lot of materials out there that's scratch resistant. So it's important you inform your client that epoxy can scratch. And also a tip we wanna give you in, once we deliver all our tables to our clients, we will typically do a last coat of oil in front of the client and then we will have the conversation with them on how to do maintenance on your table. Don't put warm uh, pots or pans and stuff on the epoxy section of your table. Use coasters, use placemats um, and it's irrelevant. You can inform your client that within 12 or 24 months you have to come and inspect the table and see if everything's in order and then you can also offer them maintenance plan or you can come and sand the table down lightly and do another coat of fresh oil for them. 
to help you also with future business and to keep your relation with your client. So this is the basic steps in how to build the perfect epoxy table. If you got any questions, you are more than welcome to ask me in the comment section below. And also remember that all the steps I mentioned now is also in this document I made on how to build the perfect rivet table. And if you guys don't mind, please help support the channel by liking this video, subscribing to our channel. And if you really want to hit the ring bell button, so you don't miss out on any future content or videos I'm posting. Now, I honestly hope that this video is going to help you to build the perfect table. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week with another super cool video. Cheers. Step 15. Step. Step 15 and your wooden slab. So you need to make sure you remove this. <sighs> Step two, a question we get a lot from our supporters and our fans out there is why do you need to remove the softwood? 